question. Thank you. That was super. Okay. Thank you, everybody. We're going to have the speakers come to the front of the room and uh, just open up the floor now for about 10 minutes or so of questions. So please come to the microphone, state your name, and indicate where you're from. And uh, uh, please be somewhat brief. We don't have enough uh, from WHRC when I say that. <laughs> oh, we're okay. Yeah. We're okay. Just Ronnie depends on what I'm saying. Yeah, right. We'll get one. <laughs> you don't want that. <laughs> Thank you. You don't want that. Okay, let's oh, get we started, go. everybody. There go ahead. Uh, Sean Adams from the Western Human Nutrition Research Center. And uh, I'm guilty as charged for being involved with uh, fructose studies, both in vitro and cell culture as well as in animal studies and whatnot, uh, human studies, working with Peter Havel of uh, using very high uh, amounts of, uh, of sugar and whatnot to look at physiology and pathophysiology outcomes. So uh, I don't think it's invalid to use those sorts of uh, concentrations and doses. I just want to make this point to the audience, but the audience, I hope, uh, will really recognize as they read all the rat literature showing high liver fat, steatosis, and everything else, as well as some of the human data, these, these are often very, very high concentrations of things that are very telling with respect to the biochemistry, but we really need to wait for the trials that are underway actually in some people's labs to look at the effects of fructose at lower concentrations or lower doses uh, that people are eating uh, out in the community. First point I wanted to make. The second point I wanted to make is I would also caution the audience. I mean, I was impressed with some of these working models, Dr. Lustig, that you have. I mean, these are rem remarkable uh, meaningful ways to link different pathways together, but they are working models. And, you know, I don't want the audience to take all of those things as fact. They're basically working models that can generate hypotheses. For example, when we give fructose to Hep G2 human liver cells, which is not an imperfect model, we never see an increase in lipogenic genes. And there's, to my knowledge, no evidence whatsoever that lipogenic gene expression is increased in human liver, unlike rat liver, by the way, suggesting a species difference. So these are just the sorts of things I would caution everybody, you know, CO2 is toxic, right? But it's around us. And so I think we really need to understand the dose and the exposure, and we need to recognize the difference between factual data based on real experiments and working models. Would you like some comments on that? Do you want to, does anybody want to comment? Well, Sean, I, I couldn't agree more. They, those are models, although each of the uh, outcomes has scientific basis. I just didn't have time to show it. I overspent my time as it was. We can talk about the specifics. They're there. They exist. Um, the other point you made is that everything's toxic. That's right. Okay, but not everything's toxic and abused at the same time. We have things that are toxic but not abused. For instance, vitamin A, vitamin D, iron. We don't have to regulate those. We have things that are abused but not toxic, like caffeine and nicotine. You can go buy Nicorette gum down at Walgreens. Okay? Not a problem. But when they're toxic and abused together, like cocaine, amphetamine, alcohol, heroin, that's when you have a problem. And what I showed was that sugar satisfies both criteria. That's a different story. Yeah, it satisfies both criteria in terms of experimental paradigms in rats giving very high doses and so on and so forth. So I'm not disagreeing that there is science to this sort of discussion. I'm just cautioning, you know, that we need to be careful how we interpret single studies. We should consider everything in aggregate. So that's, that's sort of where I'm going with things. I would just also like to comment on this whole issue of addiction that rats and humans have different kind, kinds of brains. Uh, humans actually have a prefrontal cortex. Um, and uh, the cocaine... Some, some do. <laughs> some do. <laughs> I won't take that personally. <laughs> That's because I do, and that gives me executive function to say I won't take that personally. But rats do not have executive function. And so you can t make a rat do things that a human being will not do. And so an addiction model based on rats is not something that typically works on humans. There are two sides to this story, and until we have real verifiable data 
on what really is addiction in humans. There, you know, Dr. Lustig has done a very persuasive job saying that sugar is addictive. There are at least as many people who say that is utter garbage. So. Okay. So let's move on. Let's take the one, one uh, question on that side of the room and then the four over here, and that'll be it. Uh, I'm John McNeil from the University of British Columbia. Um, just commenting on what the, uh, the first questioner stated and what I was going to point out anyway, and as uh, the speaker has just said, rats are not people. Rats have uricase that breaks down uric acid. Primates lost the ability to break down uric acid, what, two and a half million years ago or something. If you inhibit uricase in a rat, you can make all of these things happen in much lower doses of, uh, than 60% uh, of the diet. So keep that in mind when you're comparing the animal and the, uh, and the human studies. Thank you. Uh, my name is Tony Sclafani, and I study uh, rat sugar preference and appetite. I do not study addiction and won't comment on addiction. But concerning the provocative statement by Dr. Lustig about fructose, We've published 30 papers, at least in rats, and every time we give them the choice between glucose and fructose, they prefer glucose. Glucose is a much more rewarding sugar to rats than fructose. I just wanted to make that clear. Do, do you give them sucrose? We give them sucrose. We, if you give them sucrose versus maltose, they prefer maltose because it gives them twice as much glucose. Glucose has a very potent reinforcing effect when you equate for taste. That's true for the rat, it's true for the mouse. I don't know about humans. 